On behalf of the Badminton Pan American Confederation, we want to welcome you to our Coach Corner program. My name is Richard Wong, and it is my pleasure once again to be today's moderator. In today's session, we are pleased to have one of the world's leading badminton researchers. I'm referring to Dr. Martin Falström from Sweden, who today will speak on an important topic, injuries in badminton, an overview. Before giving pass to our guests, please allow me to tell you a little about Dr. Falström. He's a senior consultant and head of department of, at the Rehabilitation Medicine Clinic in the University Hospital of Northern Sweden, Umeå, since 1993. He is a PhD in sports medicine at Umeå University. His thesis was Badminton and Achilles Tendon, 2001. He's a professor in the professor of development at the medical facility Umeå University since 2018. Good evening, Dr. Falström, and welcome once again to our program. Thank you for joining us and receiving us from your home in Umeå, Sweden. We invite you to take control and share your screen. Thank you, Richard, for this introduction. I hope you can hear me well, all of you. The volume seems to be good. Yeah. Uh, I will now check that uh, the presentation is OK. You can see a full screen. Yes, it's perfect. And you can also see that I, that I change pictures. Yes. OK, thank you again. I'm uh, really honored and uh, very happy to come back to this uh, program uh, again. I, I met uh, some of you uh, in uh, October or November, and I'm happy to come back and talk about this important topic, injuries in badminton, uh, because uh, badminton is important for all of us. And uh, uh, injuries are the side effects of this sport, uh, of every sport, actually. And uh, I will give uh, an overview of uh, um, injuries and also causes and uh, some things about rehabilitation of badminton injuries. Now I changed the uh, picture and hope you can see. Is it okay? I changed now. Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. You can continue. Yeah, and uh, my background is that I, I've been playing badminton for many years. I started in the garden. I played on the Swedish national level for some years, and I got interested in uh, studying badminton. Uh, 25 years ago, I started working with BWF as on-court doctor uh, in uh, big major events. And I was very interested in not only treating, but trying to prevent injuries. So I decided to uh, go ahead with research. And in 2001, I defended my thesis on badminton and Achilles tendon, where we studied both tendon, Achilles tendon pain, eccentric training, but also the consequences of ac acute Achilles tendon ruptures. Over the last 25 years, I have had the opportunity to go to major BWF events. I've met a lot of players. I've met a lot of coaches and technical officials. And uh, um, I do that um, beside my work at the university. Uh, I will talk about injuries in badminton and make an overview over the uh, whole uh, area. But first of all, there is something that must be discussed, and that is we have to go into the loop and discuss what is actually an injury. I mean, no problems with this player. We guess that he has some kind of injury. But when it comes to what you see on TV, uh, when you see players getting injured uh, during major events, uh, it could be easy to decide that it's an injury when it comes to acute injuries, but it could be more difficult because most of the badminton injuries are what we call overuse injuries. And in this case, you see this player with a painful shoulder. You can say, when does the injury start? Is it when it hurt, the arm hurts? 
or when the player starts to change the technique or the training or say I will not train tomorrow, practice tomorrow because I have pain in my shoulder or I will not do any smashes this week, only serves and, and uh, not so hard shots. <laughs> and uh, what is an injury and what is not an injury when it comes to overuse injury. And as you can see on this player, uh, we see during major competitions, a lot of cases of what we call acute and chronic. You can see this player has uh, already an old injury or some kind of um, problems with her right leg. And uh, as I come to next picture, top shape and injuries are very close neighbors. Many players practice very, very, very hard and they push themselves and sometimes are pushed by the coaches to go to competitions when they are really on top shape, but the close neighbor is overuse injuries or acute injuries because they are playing exactly at uh, the level what they can perform. And therefore we see a lot of injuries during very important competitions, injuries that uh, are the results of long-term, very high training, high, uh, high loading of the musculoskeletal system. And then it comes to more matches than the player had expected. And then you have an injury, the injury on court. And important is also, what are the consequences of the injury for the player? On this picture, you see some uh, consequences. You use the magic eye spray and get some uh, minutes relief or just rest from uh, playing. You can use plasters or different kind of uh, uh, kits, uh, tape or whatever to try to protect the uh, shoulder or the arm or elbow from pain or from uh, uh, unnecessary movements. Some players have to go to rehab to be able to play again. And some of them have to stop because they can't play anymore. And uh, I will come back to that later, but we have seen in many studies and we have seen on big tournaments that so many players are playing with ongoing injuries. And that means uh, either they want to play even though they are injured Sometimes they don't want to play, even though they are injured. Sometimes they are not prepared for the tournament because of injury. Sometimes they cannot perform at their best because of the injury. And there is a large variety of uh, situations that might occur because up to 30% of players on the top level are playing with ongoing injuries. But I will come back to that later. Uh, in badminton, we have a wide variety of musculoskeletal injuries, bursitis, sprains, ligament injuries, muscle cramps, tendon injuries, and blisters. And many of them are associated with badminton. And there are many studies, there are many registrations being done, but uh, all these studies have different, different, different definitions. The methods differ from study to study. And that means that when you see the results of an injury study, you must think, how was this registered? Was it self-reported? Was it in an emergency clinic? Was it a sports medicine clinic? Was it something noticed on the practice level? Or was it something that happened in a big con competition? And that means that when you want to draw conclusions, uh, what caused the injury, what are the consequences of the injury, you're standing on, you're not on a uh, solid ground because the definitions and the study methods are quite different be between different studies. And many scientific journals have developed strat strategies to address the problems and they want to publish good quality studies, but there is no, so far, no consensus 
regarding the definition or classifications of injuries in badminton. And that is a big problem when you are studying, when you try to prevent, and when you try to do systematic studies on rehab or prevention of injuries. So different scientific or non-scientific studies over time have various descriptions and definitions. Uh, there might be self-reported, they might be, uh, as I said, in emergency units, retrospective, prospective registrations and all that. And that means the context. When you look in the literature, you find studies on school, uh, on school children playing badminton. You see studies on recreational players, you see on top level players. There are some statistics from big major BWF events. And the problem is that the contexts are the variations, the playing levels, and also the playing hours. We have done one uh, study in uh, my home city on the, net and on the team there, where we tried to uh, quantify the load by multiplying the hours of playing with the estimated, uh, uh, how, how hard the player estimated the training and try to multiplicate these two factors to try to get a picture of how hard does this player train and will this lead to injuries or not. But so many players are different and you estimate the load very different. So it's very difficult to compare results from different studies, even made if you do the studies in, on the same population and in the same team and on the same playing level. Uh, at a few years ago, two years ago, uh, supported by BWF, uh, we have started a serious attempt to um, get a solid base for uh, injury definition, definitions to make the injury reports more solid and uh, scientific. So a lot of um, authors work together and we made a, a Delphi approach. That means you have a definition, you send it to a lot of experts that give their op opinion, you get it back, you um, uh, work with the definition, you send it out again and so on. And after uh, three rounds, you get some kind of consensus. What is the, the, uh, the injury? How do you de define it? And how should you define it when you are uh, doing studies? And this paper is not so far as published, but the agreed injury definition was that any physical injury sustained by a player during a match or training regardless if further diagnostic tests were done or if playing time was lost. And uh, the authors uh, uh, reported seven sections that is about injury record, how things happened, the diagnosis, the mechanism, the pain, return to play after injury or return to training after injury, the grade of severity and recurrence. But so far, this is a good attempt. It is not yet published, but we expect it, uh, we expect it to be published uh, this year and will be a good base for further research on uh, badminton injuries. So uh, this work to make the solid and um, have a consensus about injury definition, this work is continuing. And now I make this short break here. Thank you. Okay, we'll have our trivia now. In today's trivia, please write whether the following statement is true. The statement is, for her last injury in the game against St. Newhall, Carolina Marin injured her right knee. Please write true or false in the chat box. Okay, so I'm going to check the chat now. Uh, Gabriella has answered. Martin has answered. Max has answered. 
David. Randy has answered. One has answered. Juanita, Raul. Phil and Janahari has answered. Anders has answered. See me? Okay, control, can we see the answer, please? The answer is true. Carolina Marin did injure her right knee. Congratulations to all our trivia winners. Please, Dr. Falstrom, let's continue with your interesting lecture. Thank you. I will share the screen again. Okay. And hope this will work. Um, I hope you yep, can see you're I back changed. up. I changed now. You see it? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. You're good to go. I will go. continue. And uh, the data I will uh, present is, I mean, with all the limitations I just talked about, different studies have different definitions, different contexts, different levels. But uh, this presentation will be mainly based on a chapter in the epidemiology, in the Olympic book of sports uh, medicine. There was a, a special uh, issue uh, 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 about epidemiology in so-called new Olympic sports about 10 years ago. And I had the opportunity to go through the literature and see what is known, what is not known, how many papers are there. And I looked at PubMed, I looked at Web of Science, and I made this compilation and um, wrote this chapter in the book. And the results I will show you now uh, are mainly based on this chapter in the book. Uh, what we can say basically about badminton is that badminton is a quite a low risk sport compared to many other sports. Different studies have shown that in thousand years, thousand years, not years, hours of badminton, you have something between one and seven injuries in thousand hours of playing. Of course, depending on the level, how, how hard you train, how hard you practice, how much uh, matches uh, compared with practice, but it's quite a low injury rate. And the same risk, approximately the same risk in both competitive and recreational players. And the lower extremities, account for a majority of all badminton injuries. We discussed that uh, last time we met uh, last year. Uh, it's the leg, the knee, uh, the ankle, the Achilles tendon that uh, accounts, they account for the majority of all badminton injuries. So in different studies, somewhere between 40 and 85% of all badminton injuries. While the upper extremities, elbow, shoulder, especially, uh, count, account for eight up to 30% of all injuries. And then spine, trunk, back is one to 20% of all injuries, depending on the study. Uh, depending on the, how the study is formed and based. There are some severe and very specific badminton injuries that are reported in some studies. And that is acute Achilles tendon ruptures. In some uh, studies, they have shown that up to 50% of all sports-related Achilles tendon ruptures are caused by badminton. But uh, that depends on the, how much uh, other sports. And now we have, for example, in Sweden, we have a lot of paddle tennis players that we didn't have 10 years ago. And it's the same in many other European countries. So this will change over time, but Achilles tendon ruptures are quite, I should not say common, but overrepresented in badminton compared to many other sports. We also have seen in some studies, a lot of eye injuries, a shuttle in the eye, and some authors suggest eye protection and in 
Some countries, uh, they recommend uh, eye protection. We have seen the same in uh, paddle tennis. We have seen the same in floorball also, that uh, unprotected eyes, uh, when you get a ball in the, in the, or a shuttle in the eye, you might have not so often, but the injuries might be quite serious. Uh, competition compared with training, the incidence is quite similar or a little higher in competition than in training. And there we have the question again about acute on chronic. Is it the, so that you train and you practice and you practice and you practice and you practice and then you go to a competition and then uh, you have the phenomenon that top shape and injuries are neighbors. Uh, you go over the edge and you get an injury that is actually an overuse injury, but uh, it occurs uh, like an acute injury. The, many, the, the majority of badminton injuries are also described as overuse injuries. And uh, in most cases, 50 to 75%, the symptoms start gradually. It could start like, uh, I mean, uh, DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness or just stiffness in the muscles. And then it uh, gets worse and then you have pain. And then it, if you examine the shoulder or the leg or the knee, you might find that there might be a tendon problem or a ligament problem or a muscle problem that could be defined as an injury. But, uh, what many authors have um, uh, written is that both competitive and recreationist players, they play even though they have ongoing symptoms or injuries. And that is very interesting. Uh, this means that uh, players who are injured, they wanna play. They wanna play with the team. They wanna play the big competitions. They want, to, they want to go practicing, even though they have injuries. That also means that in my role as a competition doctor, when, um, for example, in team events, where a team, a tie is already lost, and you want to uh, save a player from playing too much, uh, sometimes the coaches or the players says, ah, my player is injured, please examine the players. And since one up to one third of all players have uh, ongoing injuries, if you examine carefully enough, that means that sometimes a player could be injured and play if the match is important. And if the match is not important, the player is not is uh, calling for an injury and then could be substituted. That is a phenomenon I've seen myself very often in Davis Cup, for example, when one team has beaten the other team with three uh, matches to nil, and the third day, suddenly the players are injured and are being substituted. If the matches had been important, they had been playing, but since the tie is already won by one team, uh, the players don't want to play when they have ongoing injuries. That's my own, that's not a scientific experience. That's my own watching TV experience from Davis Cup uh, uh, matches. Uh, the acute injuries are, if you look at the acute injuries, most often soft tissue injuries, there are sprains, there are joint injuries, but there are also fractures. And quite often in tournaments, you see the skin wounds, depending on the tiger jumps and uh, the, uh, the, the players are jumping and they are falling on the floor and they get scratches, skin wounds, um, uh, the hands are down in the, in the surface. And since they are not allowed to bleed on court, uh, you see quite a lot of injuries like that when you watch TV and see major tournaments. Uh, so acute injuries are most often soft tissue injuries, strains and joint injuries, but the overuse injuries are more often different tendinopathies or just soft tissue injuries with a gradually onset. 
And most badminton injuries are not so severe that they require treatment in an emergency department. Uh, the author, the researcher Hamid uh, from Malaysia reported that 92% of players consulting a certain sports medicine clinic due to badminton injuries, they were back on their ordinary playing level in less than one week. So 92 of the players, I mean, even though the injury was so severe that they went to the badminton or the sports medicine clinic, they were back on their ordinary playing level in less than a week. While only 7%, one out of 14 players, uh, had more than three weeks absence for play or had to modify the play due to the injury. So most injuries, even though you look for medical consultation, most injuries are not so severe in badminton. And remember, 15 up to 30% 30, uh, 30 of badminton players, both competitive level and uh, recreational level, they are playing with ongoing injuries. It's a problem for coaches, it's a problem for players, it's a problem for organizers when people retire from matches. And uh, one might also think that can a player perform at the top level if they are injured? And that also means that if they have injuries, perhaps they haven't uh, been able to do rehab good enough, and therefore they have chronic injuries that uh, gives them problems and uh, they have uh, uh, not the best performance when they play competitions. Uh, I have myself uh, gathered data on, um, since this is from, from the last 15 years, I've been around on world championships, Olympic games, Sudeman Cup, uh, Youth Olympic Games as on court doctor and I gather data and see every week I've been to a big competition I have uh, registered how many times have I been on court and also how many of the injuries were so severe that the player had to withdraw from the uh, competition or from the match. And what you can see on this is that there were for some years about five to 10 times a week when the on-court doctor was in on court. That's what you can see on TV. Then something happened during the Olympics in London, uh, 2012. But then on the, the last years, we have seen more and more uh, on-court doctors attendances on court. And uh, when we register the reason for the doctor to go on court, we can see that the majority of the cases are just pain. They, the players want eye spray or blisters. They have been doing tiger jumps, falling on the floor, bleeding, and therefore not uh, allowed to play uh, until the bleeding has stopped. And what you can see on the uh, orange line is that the withdrawals are about the same for the last 15 years, only zero up to perhaps three players in a whole week uh, withdraw from the competition or from the match due to injury on court. And of course, what we can see is that many players who call for assistance during match, they have tape, they have uh, different um, uh, autosis, and they have old injuries and they have the old injuries that come up and be more, um, give more symptoms or give more acute symptoms. And again, top shape and injuries are very close neighbors. Uh, we did a study that's more than 20 years ago. What we did a study here in Umeå on the uh, emergency department. We looked at, uh, it was uh, a bit over 80 injuries during a five year period. We registered all badminton related injuries that were so severe at the, that they had to go to the emergency care unit at the hospital. And we found that it was, uh, I think it was 82 injuries. Uh, I've written it down, 81, 82 injuries. Yeah, 81. And 98 of the players attending the emergency care unit 
they were recreational players, and 92% of the injuries were located in the lower extremities. And what kind of injuries was it? Well, one third, the blue uh, part is Achilles tendon ruptures. One third is ankle sprains or ankle fractures. And, uh, and then uh, about 15, 16% are different kinds of knee distortions. And then you have some different other things that bleeding, uh, uh, arm uh, uh, and, uh, wrist fractures and uh, yeah, shuttle in the eye and things like that. But the majority of the severe acute badminton injuries are Achilles tendon ruptures and ankle sprains and fractures and also knee distortions. And we follow these players uh, up to seven, uh, 70 months after the injury. And we found that in the follow-up time, 10 to 69 months, more than 50% still had symptoms from the severe injuries. And only 40% of the players had, uh, sorry, 40% of the players had not returned to play in badminton again. And that was the uh, very, uh, big problem in especially Achilles tendon ruptures. And that was because of the treatment method or lack of rehab that uh, made it impossible for the players to come back to badminton again, especially if the players had not been uh, uh, treated with surgery only with plaster, then um, almost all of the ones with Achilles tendon rupture could not go back to playing badminton again. And the results indicate the importance of adequate treatment and adequate rehabilitation of acute badminton injuries, especially, of course, severe acute badminton injuries. Causing factors. Well, this is a list I have written down. This is not the more, not in the importance level, but these are the factors one might consider when it comes to badminton injuries. We must remember that the majority is overuse injuries and a majority is, are, of the injuries are located in the lower extremities. But we have different individual factors, both physiological, of course, uh, strength, muscularity, flexibility, coordination, and also psychological factors playing, even though you have pain and so on. And, um, here we have a problem that comes uh, down uh, lower or one of the other uh, factors, uh, previous injury, because you might have an injury that is not so severe, but you still go on training, practicing, playing matches, and the not so severe injury becomes more and more problematic. We can see that increasing age might be a risk factor one study I've read has seen that on competitive badminton players, most injuries happen after five to seven years of the competitive years. Uh, we have, we, one might discuss technique. Have you, do you have an adequate technique, uh, good performance in your shots and in your uh, movements on court? And of course, the quantity of the training and competition there is a saying that most of the injuries are because of too much too soon. Uh, uh, you pr practice too hard, you have too little uh, recovery, you have too little alternative training, so it is too much of the same too, so, uh, too much of the same too long time. Then you have different playing habits, what we have seen during uh, later years, tiger jumps that uh, players also need eye spray. You might perhaps know that they have changed the rules in the major events, at least, that uh, players are not allowed to ask for assistance with eye spray more than once during a match. A few years ago, they could go over and over again and ask for eye spray, but now they have changed the regulation. So if you, do, you, can, you can, of course, spray yourself in the intermission, but you are not allowed to take a break and then ask for the doctor to come in on court to give you eye spray more than once during a competition. 
uh, during a match, sorry. Then you have, of course, previous injury. Uh, you might have poor warm up. Uh, there was an old um, saying that Achilles tendon ruptures occur when you are cold and not warmed up, but that is not the uh, fact. Uh, a majority of the acu acute Achilles tendon ruptures, they are, will happen in the late uh, part of the training session. That means it's not a lack of warm up, it's more fatigue that the muscles are tired the coordination in the muscles in the calf uh, is not working anymore because of fatigue and therefore you snap your Achilles tendon. Uh, also about con uh, Achilles tendon ruptures, only one of six players with acute Achilles tendon rupture have had previous symptoms. So 85% of the players have no symptoms before the Achilles tendon snaps and uh, ruptures. Mid-season, there are some studies that have shown that during mid-season, you have the most uh, overload or overuse injuries. Then, of course, the equipment. Sometimes I get very sad when I see the players wearing shoes that are outworn, uh, bad, um, bad shoes. They have, bad, uh, they have blisters on the feet, not uh, treated adequately and therefore they cannot perform well on competitions. The court surface has been discussed very much, hard surface, slippery surface, also the temperature in the hall uh, when it's very cold. Uh, the players might uh, have more uh, musculoskeletal problems when it's very warm. There might be other problems with fatigue and uh, uh, exhaust. Uh, they, they, um, get uh, overheated and um, collapse. And then what has been discussed is the scoring system because they have changed the scoring systems in badminton a few times during the, this, centu uh, this uh, century. And uh, what we really don't know if, if the scoring system makes I mean, make the players play in another way Right now, they changed the system many years ago. It was in 2004 or five from the old scoring system because the matches were so long. They had two, se uh, two seasons, I think, with the very, very short uh, five games to 11, and then went to this uh, three games to 21. But now the uh, matches are quite long again. Some of the ladies singles, women singles, for example, last for over one hour. And that means you have the uh, problems with fatigue and uh, exhaustion uh, in the players. And Van Mechelen has uh, written about this, that once you have an injury, you must think of all the factors that might uh, cause the injury. What is the mechanism of the injury? No matter if it's an overuse injury or an acute injury, and that is related to the individual player, the physical fitness, the technique, the equipment, the training level, the quantity and the quality of the training. And then introduce preventive and measures and you might just as well write rehabilitation measures and see because the prevention and rehabilitation can be the same measures. And then you see what will happen. Can you change it uh, for especially the overuse injuries uh, from being a problem to being something that could be handled with a change of training? So you have to do the loop when you are coach or you have uh, or medical staff and meet a player with problems that most often are overuse uh, problems. So what I suggest you take home is what I just show you. There are a lot of factors that are not one factor and the evidence for all these factors are quite weak. So there is not one uh, true version of what causes the factors, but you might consider, might think of all these factors when you have a player that has um, started um, getting an injury. Uh, and 
think of Van Mechelen's uh, four steps. And then, of course, is it better to make a stop, stop from competition, stop from uh, practicing in an ordinary way, do some rehab training instead of going on and going on, uh, do the training that you perhaps do not uh, do uh, during ordinary training, uh, playing season, strength training, back training, belly training, shoulder training, instead of just badminton playing. And that is, of course, based on the individual. We talked about that when we talked about shoulder uh, injuries last time, but uh, there are uh, Christian Coppé, a Danish researcher, has seen that in especially uh, young female players, many of them have a bad balance between internal rotation and external rotation. That means that they have no good muscular balance and therefore they get uh, shoulder problems. And the solution or rehab should be build up strong uh, static muscles, uh, the uh, muscles around the shoulders, instead of playing more and more and more badminton. And again, we have to cooperate. Uh, we have to do further studies. We have to have the same definitions. We have to look at the consensus statement. I will wait to see when the paper I talked about is published. And we should start reporting and registrating injuries and try to classify them according to the criteria that are suggested in the paper I showed you earlier. And uh, of course, we need to communicate uh, coaches, players, the medical teams, not only doing rehab, but also have influence on prevention and rehabilitation of badminton injuries. We have to cooperate in, in these pictures. The player is on court, but I have communication with uh, people around the court, not the players. I have already talked to the players, and now I have to have conversation, communication with the, the trainer and also with the technical officials around. So we have to communicate uh, to uh, help the players. And that's all for the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Falstrom. We'll now move on to the question and answer section. Please, if you have any questions or comments you'd want to share, write them down in the chat box. All right. Um, very early on, Juanita asked, how do you treat sciatic nerve pain in a junior athlete? Once again, please. Juanita was asking, how do you treat sciatic nerve pain in a junior athlete? Nerve pain. That depends on the course of the pain, of uh, course. Um, she says sciatic nerve pain. Hmm? Sciatic nerve pain. Um, she specified sciatic nerve pain. Sciatic nerve pain. Um, if you have a true nerve pain, uh, could be, I mean, basically, nerve pain is uh, caused by either a conflict with a nerve uh, or some uh, uh, internal problem of the nerve. So that depends very much on and the cause of the nerve pain. I mean, there is no general way of treating nerve pain. You have to find the, the reason or the cause for the nerve pain. Uh, uh, and especially in, in, in uh, players that are not, um, I mean, players that are not grown up, they have uh, different development uh, muscles and uh, coordination. So it's quite a difficult question to ask, uh, to answer uh, at this time. I think an individual. Uh, uh, look at the examine the player, perhaps neurographic if it's severe nerve pain before you decide what to do. 
I'm sorry, I can't give you a better answer. <laughs> okay, it's a very broad question to answer, huh? All right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Another question that came up is, what can we do when our players train on a hard surface, for example, concrete? That's yeah. something very common here in Jamaica, where I am. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are, I mean, of course, uh, if you have this surface, you have this surface. And, uh, and uh, the only thing you can uh, do is uh, to have shoes. I mean, is to see that you have good shoes. And uh, I all, all often suggest that the player has two different pairs of shoes, not use the same shoes all the time have two different pairs of shoes, uh, of course, with, uh, with um, uh, good flexibility, but not use the same equipment all the time. So try to have a variation. And also, of course, when you practice, have diff variation in, it must not be the same length of the practice. It could be different. I mean, once uh, one training, one practicing hour, you can train more intensively with perhaps jumps and rushes. Next time, more uh, low load and longer, uh, I mean, running on court to try to get a variation. So the practice will not be so what you call one sided or uniform all the time. That's what I suggest. And of course, good shoes. Okay. And Vilanjana Hari is asking, during a match, are cramps not considered as an injury? Uh, that has been, that is a problem, fact, actually, because uh, every time a player is having cramp, I mean, it's an injury if the player stops playing and, uh, and uh, sits down uh, and calls for the medical assistance then of course it will be defined as an injury. And the picture I showed you on, on a lot of uh, attendances or court, we have a lot of cramps, muscle cramps. Then of course, what is the reason, why does the, it happen? Uh, for example, have you been drinking to, I mean, to less to drink or uh, not the right equipment or a longer match than you were, um, that in you were uh, expected, it is an injury on court and it will be defined as an injury on court. And uh, it might also lead to uh, that the match is closed. So even though you could discuss whether cramp is an injury or not, or more a physiological reaction, but when it happens on court in a competition, it will be defined uh, as an injury and be, will be registered as an injury. I hope that is an, uh, 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 an, uh, uh, an answer on that question. Okay, thank you. Um, what, what key elements during a warm up should we consider to help avoid injuries? Uh, first of all, Circulation, I mean, you have to uh, get warm. Warm up means you have to get in a working temperature and uh, the big muscles, the big muscles, arms, and especially the legs must have good circulation. I am not sure that uh, stretching or uh, is the best, but what you should do is, uh, uh, make sure that you reach the normal range of motion in legs, in arms, in neck. But I, I do not recommend stretching, uh, I mean, stretching to get more movement. Make sure that you have your ordinary movement, ordinary uh, range of movement in your arms, in your legs. And get the pulse up uh, that I mean that takes at least five minutes uh, often more than that mm. okay thank you um Gabriella asked to what extent due to growth do juniors 
Do young people suffer from knee injuries? Mm -hmm. um, we have one injury. I haven't talked about that. This is Morbus Oshkutschlatter. Uh, you, perhaps you know that because many uh, ad adolescent uh, athletes get pain uh, under the knee in the uh, tuberosetas tibia. That's Morbus Oshkutschlatter. They get the pain in the quadriceps insertion of the uh, of the lower leg. And that is uh, discussed whether this is immature, uh, immature bone substance. But um, what we can say about that, it comes quite often. Uh, quite often, it often uh, often uh, occurs about 10, 12, 14 years of age in the players. It is not serious, but it's a problem because it hurts. It will not be. Uh, chronic problem, I mean, it will not make uh, life hard for the player, but otherwise than during they have this injury, when they have this pain, it's about the same as with epicondylitis. I mean, it's the, the problem is the pain. The problem is not the, uh, 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 the inflama inflammation or the local reaction. The problem is the pain that makes the player not able to play. And that's the same with Morbus Oshkutschlatter. What we have seen in uh, young players also, in female players, is that uh, they get, uh, uh, they are, some of them are quite lax, they have a high laxit laxity in their joints. And the problem is in both badminton and in also in floorball, we have seen in Sweden that you have a slight injury kind of a slight distortion, uh, younger players, especially female players, and then you don't get enough rehab. You don't have the same coordination. You can compare the injured side with the not injured side, and you should have the same strength, the same coordination before you go in and on tournament again. And if you don't have the uh, normal coordination, you will probably have a higher risk of getting a more serious injury, and then um, you have a big problem. So rehab is very important when young players have, what you call it, not so severe injuries. Make sure that they, uh, they get uh, normal strength, normal coordination, and then you can uh, compare the injured side with the non-injured side and see do they work quite, uh, do they both work well? Um, how can we prevent or treat tennis elbow in badminton players? Yeah, uh, we have a uh, treatment is, uh, first of all, prevention, uh, stretching, as there is no, really good evidence, I must say that. But uh, what is often used is the stretching. Uh, I don't know if you see me now, but uh, the stretching of the extensors, that means you, uh, you rotate this, this stretching of the extensors because these muscles go over two joints, over the elbow and over the wrist. And that means that uh, you have to stretch like this when you are warm. And that is stretching for the, uh, for the tennis elbow. If you get the problem, we have tried with some success eccentric training for uh, epicondylitis for tennis elbow. Uh, the problem is there that the muscles go over two joints. So what you do is you, in eccentric training, you put the arm on a, on a table. And then you have a weight and just lower, lower down. And then you take the other hand and help up. And so lower down, you get it? You do not do the concentric, only the eccentric loading of the extensors. And we have tried it, that on pilot studies and it, it has worked out quite well. Uh, some suggest, some authors suggest, uh, I mean, uh, taping or, uh, uh, different local treatment. And uh, there have also been suggested uh, different injections. 
and also surgery. There is no evidence that surgery is effective. And uh, my recommendation is if you want to inject something, inject something that is cheap, because there are a lot of expensive stuff that uh, are not, there are no evidence. Sometimes you can try with local anesthetics and cortisone, but not before you have tried all the other, uh, all the other measures. So stretching before and also the eccentric training. And uh, eccentric training must be done, I mean, with the arm on a table uh, like this, heavy load, and then help the arm up. Uh, you can have a bag with a but bucket of water or something, and then and up and up. And so you can, that should be painful eccentric training, like the one you do in uh, Achilles tendon problems. That is my suggestion. Okay, thank you very much for that suggestion. And of, That's course, a new stretch. and of course, look at the technique. Look at the technique. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, I've learned something new today with that stretch and that uh, eccentric exercise. Okay. Um, uh, Juanita has also asked again, um, can we have an injury or consequences throughout the growth of a junior due to flat feet? Uh, um, flat feet, uh, the problem is often pronation, not that the feet is flat, but pronation. And generally, I cannot say, I mean, for these special cases, but generally, Flat feet should not be a big problem because there are good shoes that could help a person with pronation or what we say, soft feet. It's a bigger problem if the feet, is, if the feet are very stiff and hard, uh, then you have problem with, uh, with um, uh, hard, especially hard surfaces. But if you have flat foot or pronation, uh, get good shoes with uh, good uh, support and this should not be a big problem uh, actually. Okay, thank you very much for that answer. We've reached the end of today's webinar. Do you have any final words you'd like to share with the audience? I think I like this very much. I like talking about badminton with badminton interested people. And I'm so happy I had the opportunity to meet you. Uh, uh, and um, I look forward to cooperate, I mean, on court, uh, on web uh, with uh, projects and also because we all want to have fun in badminton and uh, we have to help in one way or another. So thank you very much for letting me share this hour with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Falstrom. It, it truly has been very enriching talking with you and understanding um, the nature of injuries and uh, how to treat them. Uh, I think I think in the future we, we should have you back again because I'm sure there's a lot more uh, knowledge that you have left to share. To our audience, please help us improve the quality of, of the content of our program by com completing anonymously the question that will appear on your screen. To our badminton family, we invite you to our next program discussing the topic fast track course experience. This talk will be broadcast next Tuesday, March 22nd at 3 p.m. Lima time, where we will have the pleasure of having Jamie Subandi and Rodolfo Ramirez from USA and Guatemala respectively. We'll also share the registration link in the chat box. We encourage you to write to us and make proposals of topics you are interested in. Also, we invite you to check out BPAC's YouTube channel, where you can see this and other conferences we've held. Before closing today's webinar, we greet all our audience that have accompanied us today. And in a special way, we have David from Canada, Jorge from Mexico, Randy 
from Costa Rica, Raul from Ecuador, Max from Peru, Tanya from Chile, Nancy from Bolivia, Marcus from Brazil, Giovanni from Colombia, Carolyn from Barbados, Albert from Jamaica, Generoso from Dominic Republic, uh, Anders from Sweden, Solvik from Sweden, Elizabeth from Sweden, Arnaud from France, Her from France, Sibi from the Arab Emirates, Dinesh from India, and Belenjana Hari from Madagascar. On behalf of Badminton Pan America, we thank you for your participation and hope that you enjoyed today's session. Stay well and stay safe. Thank you.